A few months after the invasion of Ukraine and the failure of the Russian army to bring a quick end to the war, the front lines have remained relatively unchanged, apart from the capture of Kherson city in Kharkiv Oblast in late 2022. Since then, there has been endless talk, rumours and speculation about the next counteroffensive, of the next push that could bring Ukraine closer to victory. With increased reports, especially after the recent Pentagon leaks of Ukrainian troop movements, equipment transfers and western weapons appearing in the countryside, the question arises, when will this upcoming offensive happen and above all, will it succeed? In this video, we'll be exploring the various factors that could decide if the Ukrainian counteroffensive will be successful. Similar to the last Ukraine video, this one will be split into different sections, those being Ukrainian material, Russian preparations and potential locations. As of the making of this video, the counteroffensive hasn't yet begun, so there will be a lot of speculation on its aims and other aspects. I'm also not a professional tactician, so these predictions won't be as if they were done by Sun Tzu in an armchair. If you're wanting to know more about this conflict, there's a series that I've made on the top right. I'd greatly appreciate if you could like, subscribe, comment, all the usual stuff. With that aside, let's delve in. Interest in the counteroffensive surged following the leaks of several Pentagon documents which covered everything from Ukrainian and Russian casualties in the war to the strength of a potential offensive. According to the leaks, between 9 to 12 brigades comprising roughly 4,000 soldiers each have been allocated for the offensive, and it's likely that some of these will be troops that have returned recently from training in Europe. In terms of numbers, it's estimated that 20,000 soldiers had completed basic training last year, with 11,000 still undergoing training in countries like Poland, Germany and the UK. To add to that number, in February, the EU announced that the total amount of troops that could be trained would double to 30,000. Such a number would likely pose a threat to the Russian army, but what about equipment? After all, 50,000 soldiers can pack a punch, but without equipment, it would be like sending tens of thousands to the deaths at Bakhmut. Hmm, wait a second. Over the last year of war, it's not surprising that Ukraine has lost a significant amount of hardware, including almost half of its tank fleet, comprising about 900 tanks before the invasion. Tens of thousands of soldiers have been killed, with many times that number still missing or wounded, and with the war now becoming one of attrition, it's clear that we're in for the long haul. Despite all of this, Ukraine has received significant military aid from the West, ranging from modernised Soviet tanks such as the Czech T-72 Avenger, armoured vehicles and Western tanks, which have featured prominently in the news in recent months. Ukraine's air force, though battered, is not only able to still contest its own airspace, but is also capable of providing an edge to any future offensive. New anti-air defence platforms such as the IRIS-T and Patriot systems have successfully hindered Russia's ability to carry out missile strikes on urban areas and will definitely prove useful in the offensive. As mentioned before, much of the coverage has been on the Western tanks that have been pledged by multiple countries. These include the German Leopard 2, British Challenger 2 and the American Abrams, with the West pledging over 100 in total. On average, these possess greater speed, armour and all-around offensive capabilities which outstrips that of most Soviet tanks, like the T-64 and the T-72. However, there are some caveats. The Ukrainian tank crews which were selected have still not completely finished their training, with an observation in Poland having noted training accidents, including the turret of a Leopard 2 popping off the chassis during a collision. Given their relatively small numbers, their impact will be limited. With Christopher Cavoli, the Supreme Allied Commander of NATO forces in Europe, stating that they won't be a silver bullet. Tanks alone won't win the war, but this doesn't mean they won't make a difference. I'll link a list of military aid that has been sent to Ukraine in the description. Plenty of armoured vehicles such as American Bradleys and the French AMX-10s will play an invaluable role in supporting both tanks and infantry assaults when the time comes, which now brings us to preparations on the Russian side. Over the last six or so months, the Russians have constructed fairly elaborate defensive positions across the Dnieper River, across Crimea and the Donbass in anticipation of a potential Ukrainian attack. Much of these defences have consisted of the classics, those being concrete pillboxes, minefields, barbed wire, etc. The bulk of these have been concentrated in Crimea and the southern edges of Kherson Oblast, likely indicating that the Russians expect the counteroffensive to be aimed towards Crimea, which is arguably the most symbolically important part of occupied Ukraine. Recent mobilisation campaigns have also allowed the Russian army to concentrate more forces in areas deemed at risk. 
Compared with last year, the Russians have launched more precise and coordinated assaults whilst keeping large portions of their forces in reserve, so the Russian army has been expecting this for some time. But whether these preparations will hold, we can only wait and see. Now, perhaps the most important question remains, when and where will the offensive be? Once again inferring from information from the Pentagon leaks, it's expected that the mud season, also known as the Rasputitsa, will end in the first couple of weeks of May. Ukrainian footholds established along the left bank of the Dnipro River and the creation of supply points there does suggest that the attack may come at the end of April, or at the very least the beginning of May. Whilst the advance of Ukrainian forces along the Dnipro River implies that the offensive will aim towards the rest of Kherson Oblast and perhaps Crimea, this is quite unlikely. As we looked at before, the Russians have prepared fairly formidable defensive systems on the peninsula, and the land connection between the Donbass and Crimea will enable the Russian army to send reinforcements if needed. So, where else could the Ukrainian army strike? An advance towards Melitopol and Mariupol near the Sea of Azov would allow the Ukrainians to sever this land bridge between Crimea and Donbass. This would make Crimea far more vulnerable to a future Ukrainian attack, and it would also endanger Russian troops in Kherson Oblast. Given current information, the Ukrainians may attempt to target Melitopol or launch a feint to confuse the Russians, similar to the Kharkiv offensive last year where the Russians believed that Kherson would be attacked. At the time of making this, it's difficult to fully predict where the assault will be staged, with a media blackout in place to prevent information leaks, so any one of these is a possibility. Even with the counter-offensive slated for next week at the earliest, it's hard to say whether the offensive will succeed. Sure. Ukraine possesses more advanced armor and weaponry than it ever has before, but the Russians have learned from their experiences over the last year. If they play their cards right, then this might truly be the next step to victory. Only time will tell. With current events of the war, and the fact that this has been anticipated for a long time, I thought I'd make this video just to cover it. Obviously I could be completely wrong, since it is mostly speculation after all, but it will be interesting to see how it unfolds. Once again, I'd greatly appreciate if you could drop a like, subscribe, leave a comment, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Anyway, I'm Irovic and I'll see you in the next one.